Prosperity Theater in New York City. Uh, we are the greatest city in the world, yet more than one million residents are considered food insecure. That is unacceptable, and today the council will be voting on a package of legislation designed to expand New Yorkers' access to healthy, affordable food. <clears throat> We're doing this in the shadow of a hostile federal government, and I know a lot of people who rely on these programs are terrified. What the White House and what has been happening on the federal level is disgraceful, but what the council is doing here today is sending a message that we will fight to secure the social safety net in our city for all New Yorkers. Uh, to begin, the council will be voting on two resolutions sponsored by Councilmember Farrah Lewis, who's here. Uh, resolution number 1025 it calls on the state legislature to pass and the governor to sign legislation to opt in to the SNAP restaurant meals program to allow disabled, elderly, and homeless SNAP recipients to use their benefits on hot meals and other prepared foods that participate in grocery stores, delis, and restaurants. Right now, that is not allowed. This would make New York State the largest municipality, uh, the, it would make us the largest place in the country to participate in the program. The next resolution by Councilmember Lewis is resolution number 1024A, and it would call on the New York State Office of Temporary and Disability Assistance to expand eligibility for SNAP to public college students. Students. Federal law prevents most able-bodied students who are enrolled in college at least half time from being eligible for SNAP unless they work 20 hours a week. States can expand on those regulations by exempting students in certain college and training programs from the work requirement. College students are not immune to food insecurity and students should never have to choose between a Metro card, taking care of their financial obligations or their next meal. And we know that's happening right now, which is why this past budget we funded a pilot program for CUNY students uh, to make sure that they would have access to food at food pantries and to give them access to food on campus. And we're getting a wonderful response from CUNY students all across New York City from that program. Program. So I want to call up Councilmember Lewis, who has these two very important resolutions, and congratulate her on both of these. Congratulations, right. Farrah. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Councilmember Farrah Lewis, representing the 45th District in Brooklyn. Brooklyn actually has the highest number of Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, which is also known as SNAP, recipients out of all the five boroughs. Over half a million Brooklyners rely on federal food assistance. Federal programs like SNAP are designed to support our most vulnerable populations, but in reality, these very same populations often face several barriers to access this support. I am proud to sponsor these two resolutions dedicated to removing these barriers and expanding food equity for over one million New Yorkers who are food insecure. Resolutions 1024, as mentioned earlier, now coupled with subsequent action by Governor Cuomo will expand SNAP eligibility for public college students by allowing them to use their classroom hours to satisfy employment requirements. This will allow students to focus on completing coursework rather than paying for basic needs while ensuring they are able to study and learn free of the mental, physical, and emotional symptoms of chronic hunger. Resolution 1025 calls upon the state partners to opt into already established SNAP restaurant meals program, which will allow disabled seniors and homeless SNAP recipients to use their benefits on hot meals and other prepared foods at participating grocery stores, delis, and restaurants, or bodegas. Uh, these people already receive benefits but often face difficulty preparing balanced meals for themselves and their families. This program would guarantee a hot meal regardless of ability or access. When I experienced food insecurity, safety was my priority. Finding a nutritious dinner became an afterthought. The dignity of being able to feed myself a hot, balanced meal could not be understated. We're facing a reality where our neighbors are forced to choose between paying their rent, tuition, utilities, versus buying groceries and feeding their families. I am so grateful to be a part of this body as we work to end food insecurity crisis right here in New York City. Today we are voting on legislation that stands to close the equity gap at all levels, from encouraging the use of local farmers, farmers markets, and establishing citywide food policy office. 
The creative solutions put forward by my colleagues um, promise a better New York for everyone. Thank you so much, Speaker Johnson and my colleagues for putting in action and being advocates for food policy right here in New York City. Thank you so much. Congratulations. Thank you all. Uh, next is introduction number 1650A, sponsored by Councilmember Adrian Adams, uh, and it will require the Human Resources Administration to provide information about the Health Bucks program and farmers markets in New York City to all individuals who receive or apply to receive supplemental nutritional assistance program benefits, SNAP benefits, food stamps. In 2005, the city created the Health Bucks Initiative, which gives New Yorkers $2 in Health Bucks that can be spent at participating farmers markets for every $5 spent using SNAP. This bill is designed to help ensure that more SNAP recipients are taking advantage of the Health Bucks program, and I want to invite Adrian up to speak on this really important bill. Congratulations. Thank you so much, Speaker Johnson. Good afternoon. I'd like to thank Speaker Johnson and all of my colleagues for their leadership and partnership on this timely package of legislation that will affect the lives of numerous New Yorkers facing the life-threatening issue of food insecurity. Unfortunately, our current food system is broken. Every day, people struggle to pay for food, to feed themselves and their families. We need to increase access to healthy, nutritious food for New Yorkers with easy and affordable ways for residents to meet fruit and vegetable requirements. Previous efforts to increase food access have not created the comprehensive, systemic change needed to dismantle the deepening racial and economic inequities experienced in too many communities across the city of New York. Drastically, our food system continues to exacerbate existing gaps in access and continues to alienate historically marginalized communities. New efforts to increase food equity are needed that cross multiple sectors as unhealthy food is a problem that falls disproportionately on poor and low income people, creating the false narrative that they will only eat fast food. They love fast food. This is exponentially false. The number of vegetarians, vegans, and otherwise healthy food consumers represented by complying food options in com communities of color are staggering. A healthy diet can be transformative. My bill, intro 1650A, mandates the requirement of HRA to inform SNAP recipients about the Health Bucks program, its benefits, and enhancement of healthy eating, and the obligation of farmers markets to accept these recipients. Once again, thank you to the speaker for his leadership and support of this legislation that will benefit hundreds and hundreds of New Yorkers and their families. Congratulations, Adrian. Uh, next is introduction number 1659A, sponsored by Councilmember Margaret Chin, and it will require the Department of Social Services working in collaboration with the Department for the Aging to develop a plan to identify and enroll seniors who are eligible for, but not currently enrolled, to receive SNAP benefits. Uh, Margaret is at a bill signing, so she couldn't be here, but I know she's very proud of this bill. Next, we have two economic development bills that are also focused on combating food insecurity. Proposed introduction number 1664A, sponsored by Councilmember Vanessa Gibson, will require the Mayor's Office of Food Policy to formulate a 10-year food plan policy for New York City. Currently, there is no comprehensive citywide food policy plan with a formal community engagement <laughs> strategy or consistent and meaningful tools to measure the impact of city agencies' efforts to address food issues. The office would be required to develop this comprehensive plan within 180 days following the bill's passage, and the office would also be required to report on the 10-year plan to the mayor and the speaker every two years after it is released. I want to invite Councilmember Gibson, the chair of our subcommittee on the capital budget and finance, to come speak on this important bill. Thank you. Congratulations, Elsa. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon to all of my colleagues who are here. It's really an honor and a privilege to stand with my colleagues today as we discuss food equity in the city of New York. I am proud to be the sponsor of Intro 1664, which will ultimately mandate that the Mayor's Office of Food Policy create this 10-year policy plan in consultation with all of our relevant city agencies, our community-based organizations, community leaders, stakeholders, food advocates, 
as well as many others to focus on areas of importance, food equity, food justice, and food insecurity. The goals of this plan we fundamentally believe are to reduce hunger across the city, improve nutrition, improve access and opportunity, and increase access to healthy food. This legislation will also mandate that the Office of Food Policy within 18 months of this legislation's passage and afterwards every two years thereafter to submit a report that really assesses the city's progress towards the goals of this plan to the mayor, the speaker, and post it on the city's website. We cannot move forward as this great city we are without solving the issue of food equity across our city if we do not have a comprehensive and strategic food policy plan. The city of New York has huge purchasing power that can make a significant difference if we study how we spend taxpayer dollars when it comes to food. This evening, just on tonight and every night thereafter, there are families and individuals in our collective districts that go to bed hungry. There are children that will wake up tomorrow and go to our schools that are hungry. We have to ask ourselves, how is this even possible in the city of New York? This legislation will become a critical foundation for the great work to continue in making a difference and ending food insecurity in our city. We cannot and we will not wait for the federal government or even the state of New York as we begin this work. Let us set the example for others to follow in how we address food insecurity across this city. I want to thank our speaker, Corey Johnson, the chair of our Economic Development Committee, Councilmember Paul Vallone, but particularly all of the food advocates who are relentless in their commitment and their dedication each and every day to fight for policy and budget changes and really resources that will come to our neighborhoods. Equity advocates, community food action at, in my district of New Settlement Apartments, Edible Schoolyard NYC, Children's Aid Society, the West Side Campaign Against Hunger, Just Food, American Heart Association, Hunger Free America, No Kid Hungry, and many others. And also I want to say that as council members, it is our responsibility to work with this administration, but we also have to be creative in our approach. Health Bucks is a great option. Making sure that our residents are applying for SNAP is also another option. I was very blessed just last week to join elected officials in the Bronx along with the New York City Department of Economic Development, EDC, as we opened the largest food bazaar in the Bronx, 83,000 square feet of supermarket right in our borough in the Bronx Terminal Market. This is transformative, it's a game changer. And this food bazaar that we welcome into the West Bronx is culturally sensitive, is culturally diverse. The food is affordable, it's quality, there are sales. It provides so much opportunity for those that may have a plant-based diet, those are vegans, and that's exactly what we need, not just in the Bronx, but all across the city of New York. So it is my hope that we continue to work with the Mayor's Office of Food Policy, because we need a plan. You have to have a plan. We can have all the passion in the world, we can recognize our purpose, but we can do nothing without a plan. And a 10-year food policy plan is the way to go. It is a step in the right direction. It recognizes the challenges we face. It collaboratively works with agencies and stakeholders on the ground. And at the end of the day, we want to solve the food insecurity challenge that we have all across the city of New York, particularly in immigrant communities and low-income communities. Just because you're on a fixed income, it does not mean that you should not have access to healthier food options. And so I look forward to working with our speaker and all of my colleagues in the city council as we work together towards a healthier city of New York. Thank you, everyone. Uh, next is proposed introduction number 1666A, sponsored by Councilmember Ben Kalos, and it will codify the Mayor's Office of Food Policy within the city charter and delegate specific responsibilities to the office.
Currently, the office exists pursuant to a mayoral mandate and coordinates food policy initiatives and reports along with the Mayor's Office of Sustainability, the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, and other agencies. To date, the office has not yet been codified into law or given a legislative mandate. As I said earlier, we have a hostile federal government and taking concrete steps like this to make sure that combating food insecurity is in our mission as a city government is essential. So I invite Councilmember Kalos to come up and speak on this important bill. I want to start with a thank you to our speaker, Corey Johnson, uh, who released a report in August of 2019, less than a year ago, on gro the growing food equity in New York City. Uh, and for making this a priority, this is part of a multi-part package of bills. We've been working on this since I got elected, and in fact, this is predates me, uh, Council Member Brad Lander, who is here on another mm -hmm. bill that he's been working on for far too long, uh, passed over the mantle to let me do a lot of the work on this after he'd already done so much of the work uh, tilling the soil and uh, planting mm -hmm. the seeds. So all I had to do was uh, uh, reap what grew. In the wealthiest city on, in America, let alone the planet, there's no reason anyone should be going hungry. When you think of food insecurity, this isn't a resource problem, especially when we are literally paying farmers not to grow food. This is an information problem. This is a distribution problem. And we need a office of food to look at the heart of the problem, get to the heart of the problem. Uh, we serve so many meals every single day as a city. 1.1 million children now have free breakfast, free lunch. We're working on getting free supper. That is 3.3 million meals a day. Uh, we have our shelter system, which is serving all uh, 60,000 plus families and children. Uh, we have a senior system, DFTA, uh, that so many of my seniors in my district and seniors all over the city rely on those breakfast, lunch, and dinners. We, we are doing so much as a city to feed people at so very many different agencies. I believe it is 10 or 12 in total. And so when I was chair of governmental operations, we had oversight over about a dozen different agencies. And even with that oversight power, trying to get all those agencies in the same room to cooperate, I have a laundry list of laws that require these people to cooperate, and it is hard. Uh, we've had a mayor's office of food policy, and that office sat vacant for quite a while, and it was there at the discretion of the mayor who could have just as easily erased the office than put somebody in there. We have a great new director in that office. This will codify this office moving forward for whomever the next mayor is, and rather than just having a title without a portfolio, then starting as soon as this is signed into law, once we pass this, the director of the mayor's office of food policy is going to be able to point to the New York City Charter when they order agencies to come to the table around things that we're hoping to pass soon, like good food procurement yep. and using our dollars. We did a hearing on this to buy local and support local agriculture. You can talk to Manhattan Borough President Gail Brewer about taking a trip to a New York State farm and how we can buy New York onions instead of California onions. But these are the kinds of things that can literally uh, save folks with access to healthy food and also save our planet by not shipping onions from California. There's a lot that this office can do, and whether it's the 10-year food plan or coordinating good food procurement mm -hmm. or just making sure that we're actually ha providing access to healthy food at all of our agencies, this is incredible. I want to thank the speaker again because this would not happen without his leadership. I want to thank Brad Lander for getting this started before I got here and all the colleagues who are part of this entire bill package. Thanks, Brad. Congratulations. Thank you. Okay, next, uh, final two bills uh, by Councilmember Lander. Uh, we'll take the first one first. Uh, the council will be voting on a piece of legislation out of the Finance Committee that I mentioned earlier to better track capital projects happening in the city. Talk to any council member, talk to any community board, talk to anyone who lives in a neighborhood that cares about a yes. capital project, whether it be a park, uh, something at public housing, a transportation project, a library, and you will hear the frustration around 
how capital projects go into a black hole and you don't know how long they're gonna take to get done. So proposed introduction 113A, sponsored by Councilmember Lander, would require the creation and implementation of a public online capital projects database to track the progress of capital projects citywide. This database would be, the, uh, would be the first time the city tracks capital projects across agencies in one system in a public manner. Right now it's done in sort of a piecemeal way, which Brad can talk about. It will provide critical information and data regarding these projects to the administration and to the public, and will hopefully lead to improved capital project delivery. And before we get to the final bill, I invite Brad to speak on this important bill, which he's been working on for a long time. Thank you so much, Speaker. And I just want to quickly first uh, congratulate my colleagues on the food equity bill. You know, I think it could be easy if you live in a neighborhood like I am lucky to and with my family to think New York City has like every wonderful food option you could ever want and like go about your day and never see a city in which we have people who, uh, you know, who are, who are essentially starving, you know, and who don't have access to good, healthy food. Um, and we gotta fix that. So I just really wanna thank council members Kalos, Gibson, Adams, and Lewis for moving us forward here on the speaker and, and council member Chin as well. Um, as Corey said, you know, every council member, and I think probably every reporter as well, I was a little sad actually that Yoav was getting married when we uh, announced the bill that was <laughs> happening. Um, if you've tried to dig in on a capital project and understand why is it taking so long, or even just how long is it taking, uh, how much does it cost, is it over budget, that seems like a fairly obvious thing you'd, you'd be able to do. And actually this comes in part because when we started participatory budgeting, people had voted on projects. And so it was pretty natural for them to say, great, how can we see what's up with the projects we voted for? At the time, the answer really was you could not at all. Almost none of the projects were online to be tracked at that time when we started participatory budgeting uh, seven or eight years ago. Now there's, as Corey said, a patchwork of tracking. So the Mayor's Office of Operations keeps a capital projects dashboard which covers projects over 25 million, but that's only 3% of the city's capital projects and not most of the ones that are generated by council members or by community. The Parks Department set up their own tracking system which has some good features, but for example, does not tell you what the original promise date or the original cost was. So you can't kind of do an analysis to see about delays or, or overages. SCA has a different system. Um, and then several of the major capital agencies don't yet do that at all. So the need for a transparent, accessible, downloadable online public database for the city's capital projects available to the public, available to the media, available to the council and the community boards, and available to the city itself as a project management tool is pretty clear. You've got to be able to compare projects across agencies. How much are bathrooms costing in the schools versus in the parks department? Did one contractor do well for us if they are poorly for us across a couple of agencies? So this is just good plain common sense. It will be challenging to do because there's a lot of agencies with a lot of different technology and obviously the procurement of a city capital uh, of a technology project by itself is often, you know, goes on longer than you think. So um, an interagency task force is being set up that the Mayor's Office of Operations and OMB DDC and other agencies are on. There'll be an advisory board that the council has representation on to make sure we get there. And one good thing is in the meantime, even before that new system gets fully set up, uh, the uh, mayor's, the administration has agreed to start filling out again what's called the capital projects data report in the city's financial management system, which does not have near as much information as the ultimate tracker will have, but is a good resource and it'll, it is now available in downloadable, machine readable format and will be three times a year. Uh, so a good new resource has been created for our work even in advance of getting started on this capital projects tracker. A uh, big thank you to Rebecca Chasen who really did lots of the work to push this forward. Um, and it really was collaborative with the administration as well. I was actually joking with uh, uh, the minority leader, Matteo, today because his predecessor, Jimmy Otto, was maybe the most vociferous about delayed capital projects of any person ever. Um, and uh, uh, minority leader Matteo made clear that like things have gotten better over the last couple of years. There's really progress at DDC and I'm grateful that the administration has agreed to establish this tracking system which will really make progress in the future. And obviously all those long-term needs of climate resiliency, of aging infrastructure, of a growing city um, is something we've just gotta have. So speaker, thank you very much. Brad, don't go far.
Uh, our final bill, uh, we have a really, really important bill, and I'm really proud of Brad for his incredible work on this. This bill from Councilor Lander is aimed at getting the most dangerous vehicles off of New York City streets. These are ve vehicles that rack up red light and speeding tickets. They are a small but dangerous group that put the safety of New Yorkers at risk every single day. We can't continue to watch the number of pedestrians being killed by vehicles go up without taking bold action to hold reckless drivers accountable. This bill is that bold action and I'm really proud that we got it done. Proposed introduction number 971A, sponsored by Council Merlander, would create a, quote, dangerous vehicle abatement program. DVAP. Are, DVAP. <laughs> DVAP. That requires owners of vehicles with five red light camera violations or 15 speed camera violations within 12 months to take a safe vehicle operation course offered by the Department of Transportation. And before I call Brad up, I just want to, everyone should know this. Uh, Brad has been working on this for a very long time, but I think the last six, seven, or eight months, he has been literally meeting on a weekly basis, maybe multiple times a week, with the law department, with the council lawyers, with the advocates, with other folks that have been involved. And this was not easy. It was complicated. There were constitutional issues that were involved that we needed to sort through. I want to thank Kelly Taylor from my staff, who worked really closely with Brad in, in getting this done. She's right here. She did an amazing job. And I know Brad's staff worked hard on this transportation alternatives. Families for Safe Streets, Bike NYC, a lot of the great groups that were involved in this. Today is a big day. It's another step forward in reclaiming our streets for pedestrians and for cyclists and for saying that if you are going to operate a car in New York City or a truck or a bus, we want to make sure that you're abiding by the law. And if you're someone who is reckless, if you're someone who is dangerous, if you're someone who is a persistent violator, we need to come up with methods to get you off the streets. Because when you sit there and you look in the eyes of of a parent who just lost a five-year-old, or a wife who just lost their husband, which is literally happening every day, people that are seriously injured or killed a couple of times a week, you see that we are not doing enough. This bill is us doing something that no other state, no other city in the United States of America has ever done before, and it's because of Brad's leadership, his staying with it approach, and I'm really, really proud of him, and I'm proud the council has taken this step today. So I want to invite Brad up to speak on the DVAP program. All right, DVAP. Uh, we always say thank you to the speaker, and I mean, we always mean it, but, uh, but in this case, it's really, uh, all right. In this case, uh, it really is true that, that, Corey, without your really steadfast support, it would not have been possible to move this forward. This bill faced a lot of different challenges, legal and operational, and without really your just steadfast support working together with my office and our team and, and the advocates, there's no way it would have happened, so thank you. Um, two years ago on March 5th, 2018, uh, a reckless driver with a history of running red lights and speeding past schools killed two beautiful kids in our neighborhood, four-year-old Abigail Blumenstein and one-year-old Josh Liu, and uh, hit their uh, Abigail's pregnant mom as well, who lost her, her, her baby. And it really like just like was a gut punch to uh, our whole neighborhood. And of course, every one of those crashes is a gut punch. Since that time, two years ago, 400 New Yorkers have been killed in traffic crashes on the streets of our city. Um, and we're so fortunate that some of those folks, the family members from Families for Safe Streets, find a way through that shattering grief to organize into an advocacy force designed to save the lives of other people's children and loved ones. Um, and I'm really grateful to be a partner with, uh, with them and, and held accountable by them. We've done a lot of work together to make the streets of our city safer, reducing the speed limit, a lot of engineering and intersections and, and roadways, education, the camera program. But a thing that this crash made clear is that we are not yet focusing enough attention on the most reckless drivers. It's intuitive that the most reckless drivers are disproportionately likely to injure or kill other New Yorkers, but it is not something yet that any city or any state is really focusing on, in part because the camera program is what makes it possible and it did not exist before. So um, what we're doing here, as Corey said, is 
we will focus on the most reckless drivers as a result of speed camera and red light violations. We have been calling it the Reckless Driving Accountability Act, but it's now known as the Dangerous Vehicle Abatement Program. And if you really want the legal details, we can, we can talk about it afterwards. Um, but that program will look at the most reckless vehicles out there, those that have gotten 15 speed camera violations or five red light cameras uh, violations in a 12-month period, um, and declare those vehicles rec dangerous vehicles, a danger to uh, their neighbors. And the owners or the drivers who are responsible for operating so recklessly will have the opportunity to participate in a driver accountability program modeled on a course that's offered by the Center for Court Innovation at the Red Hook Community Justice Center. And the council under the speaker's leadership actually helped expand that course to Staten Island and several other boroughs last year. Um, and it's been proven to have a good impact to reduce recidivism in reckless driving about 40%. It's small classes. You get people to listen to and hear from people who have lost loved ones and start to make the connections they have not been making between their reckless driving behavior and the likelihood that someone, one of their neighbors, could be injured or killed. And we really are seeing meaningful impacts. Um, but if the vehicle's owner or responsible driver fails to take that driver accountability program, then that vehicle will be subject to impoundment by the New York City Sheriff because you cannot operate your car like a weapon aimed at your neighbors with no consequence. And that's what this legislation changes. So uh, it's an innovative, data-driven, restorative justice approach, first of its time in the country. Um, I know some people would like to see the law go even further and cover more reckless drivers, um, and I would too. So the bill provides for a thorough evaluation of the program, how well it works to change people's reckless driving behavior, reduce crashes, and save lives, and that'll be available in advance of the end of the three-year pilot phase of the program so that the city council can adjust, amend, and expand that program. Uh, I'll do some quick thank yous because it took a lot of work to get here, as Corey said, on our team, Kelly Taylor and her team here uh, were invaluable. Valuable. On my staff, Julia Ehrman did an enormous amount of work. Thank you, Julian. I forgot to shout out Steph Sokowski on the Capital Projects tracking bill uh, and Naomi Dan as well. Um, I'll shout the advocates out in the chamber. They are incredible, but I'm not going to list them all here. Um, but I do just want to end, uh, well, one, this would not be possible without them and what it means to have them taking voice in our city and holding us accountable to a safer city is really uh, very profound, like we feel it in a, in a pretty deep way. Uh, and finally, this was a real collaboration with the administration. It took some organizing and some pushing to get going, um, but we got really good collaboration from uh, Commissioner DOT, Commissioner Polly Trottenberg, from the law department, from the sheriff, who I had not met before, uh, but you should meet him sometime. He's a character, uh, and from City Hall as well. So I want to say thanks to all of them, but again, big, big thanks uh, to Corey for his leadership and making it possible to get this over the line. Um, we got a long way to go to reach that vision zero where we won't have anyone lost to traffic crashes, but today we are keeping the promise that we made to Abigail and Joshua's families uh, to focus on the most reckless drivers and take big ambitious steps to save lives. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. And I want to mention uh, we made some committee reassignments today because when Councilmember Espinal left, uh, we had to rejigger the committees, and I'm really proud that Councilmember Andy Cohen is now the chair of the uh, Committee on Consumer Affairs and Licensing. Uh, he is uh, he's a great, great, great member, very thoughtful, very hardworking, someone who I think is loved across uh, ideological lines here in the council because of what type of colleague he is. So I want to congratulate him on becoming chair of that committee. And with that, I'm happy to first take on-topic questions. On topic first, Gersh. Well, first, um, you know, Brad and you and Holly Trottenberg and the mayor have spoken very eloquently about the challenge of the reckless driver, as it now is called EVAP, uh, making sure it works properly, you know, once it's in place. But was there, just on a personal level, Mr. Speaker, was there any kind of disappointment that uh, you couldn't push the mayor further or didn't push the mayor further to say, you know what, 15 speeding tickets is truly reckless, 10 speeding tickets in 12 months is truly reckless. Why can't we get that number down to 10? The mayor could have said, oh, we can make this plan work, just spend more money, put more resources into it. Could we have pushed him more on that? I, I want to be fully uh, candid and transparent, which is I wasn't, in this instance, involved with negotiating the bill. Brad was. 
uh, Brad was with Kelly Taylor from my team. They were the ones that were sitting down and I sort of delegated to them and empowered them. So uh, Brad and Kelly were updating me as the process was unfolding, but I really, all because of the hard work that Brad put into this, I didn't sort of interject myself and I said, Brad, whatever you need and whatever you think is viable and doable, I support. So I wasn't part of those conversations. Brad can give some context on how we got there. Um. Corey did let the mayor know that this was an important priority for him and the council. So, uh, I, you know, obviously, as I've said, I'd love to see this program be bigger. Sure, somebody who's run 10 or 12 speed camera violations in a year feels very much like a reckless driver who we're worried about. But there's a lot of reasons to want this program to work. As Corey mentioned, there's not anything like it anywhere in the country. And we've got work to do to make sure it really works. One thing we know from the Red Hook Just Community Justice Program is small classes is critical to actually getting people to reflect on their behavior as opposed to like some online course where you're like hitting a button, which would not have a chance of changing people's behavior. So, I mean, could you just run a ton more small classes? Theoretically, you could, but there are real capacity issues. We talked to the, I mean, the Center for Court Innovation who run that program about what it might look like to scale. And I will just say that by the end, DOT and the administration were a real partner here. It took a while to get us all kind of around the legal framework, and, but at the end, everybody wants to see this program succeed. And while you might want it to be bigger, everybody also knows like, it's challenging for government to stand up big programs, and if we do it poorly and it doesn't work and we can't evaluate it or the classes aren't good or the sheriff doesn't have the ability to you know, tow those additional cars, then we're gonna be sorry, and, and the, we thought the th 5,000 is an awful lot of you know, reckless drivers, <laughs> too, <laughs> excuse me. Um, and we believe it's the right place to start and that the evaluation will help us learn from it. Maybe we'll adjust that program. There might be other things we even wanna look at in accounting for you know, key, speed cameras and red light cameras are one thing, but we get some information from insurance companies or look at hit and runs or other kinds of things so we can make an even more ambitious and successful program. So, um, so just to be clear, so the reason that it's um, this five and fifteen is because it hits that five thousand driver. Yes, I mean, there's, it is important also to flag here that the massive expansion of the speed camera program was also a factor because. Mm -hmm. If we left it at the place where the original bill was introduced, five in a combination of red light or speed cameras, I think it would likely be like 100,000 by the time the cameras are, are stood up, way beyond our capacity to implement a solid program. So really two different issues here, the expansion of the speed camera program and a thinking about what's the size at which the program can be run well. And we did take real advice from DOT and the Center for Court Innovation about the size of a program they're confident that they can run well, they're gonna be implementing it. And, and, I, and so having them on board with a real uh, commitment to the integrity and quality of the program is, is important. So yes, we basically chose that number as something that could be effectively implemented and then worked backward to the thresholds of 15 and five. And just hypothetically, if uh, when this ramps up in 2021, if there are actually fewer drivers in this, like there's only a thousand drivers, would you wait for the pilot to be over to, or would you just say, okay, let's say if you get 14 or 12 or 13, work that way? D DOT seems a lot more concerned it's going to be more rather than fewer. I think mm -hmm. they think it could be closer to 10,000 than 5,000 because we're basically increasing the camera program tenfold. It's you know about five times as many cameras, but they're on twice as much of the day. So that's 10 times as much mm -hmm. camera ticket writing. So you know um, it would take, they can, they, if it's more, then they can capture the more. You know, if you commit five or 15 and it's 10,000 vehicles, then they can, they'll have to figure out how to implement 10,000 vehicles. If it's fewer, we'd have to come back and amend the program. So whether the council would be inclined to do that or wait out the pilot and then expand it is to be determined. But my sense is it's likely to be more rather than fewer. Any other questions on topic? Okay, off topic. Bob. Yeah, just a follow up on the, uh, Yes. That there's reports and they confirmed that that they've communicated with you that they made a threshold on signing for one particular group. Where is there a little progress update report you can share with us? I support unionization and I'm proud of them for their organizing. Um, they have not, I believe, delivered, actually signed cards to us, is my understanding, but they've told us that they have received a majority of people that have signed on 
from members district offices and from particular staff titles within the finance division. I see, they call them council matic. I didn't even know such a thing existed. <laughs> That's what every person is considered who works in a district office staff, <coughs> which is different than the titles in the central office staff. Mm -hmm. So uh, I believe they say they've gotten uh, a requisite number of councilmanic aides, and that's anyone who works in our district office staff in all 51 offices. And then I believe they said that they have gotten certain titles in the finance division that have signed on as well, not in land use, not in legislative, not in administrative services, not in CED, not in the other divisions, just that one division. Uh, I have been supportive of their efforts. I have not put up any roadblocks. I've said over and over and over again that I support them and what they're doing, but also this needs to be done in a legal way. There are legal guidelines that prescribe what is allowed, what's not allowed, what are the thresholds, and I'm not uh, an employment lawyer. I do have some very talented lawyers here on staff who are working with them, who are speaking to them, who are in contact with the folks that have been doing a great job organizing, coupled with the law department who has some role in this, and eventually the Office of Labor Relations may have a role on this. We're all, this is a brand new sort of uh, field for us because this has never been done before at the council. It's never been done, I believe, before in any other legislature besides, I think, Delaware uh, just did it. And so we want to make sure we handle this in an appropriate way. So uh, I assume this is going to take a little while to sort through, uh, but I'm proud of the work they've done. I'm proud to support their efforts, and I'm sure we'll get through it in a way that respects uh, unionization efforts and also handles it in a way that's prescribed by law. Yeah. The honest answer is I don't know. And the reason why I don't know is because we're in some uncharted territory. And so we want to make sure we do this correctly. Um, you know, I haven't had any conversations with uh, folks about this on the staff level, besides my chief of staff, who has to be one of the, the point people involved and the general counsel. Um, so I can't tell you what that looks like. I think there are some outstanding questions. The outstanding questions are, does this group negotiate with the Office of Labor Relations? Do they negotiate with the speaker? Do they negotiate with, uh, we, don't, we don't know yet. And so those are questions that we have to figure out. But again, I support their efforts. I support unions. I support supporting workers. And I'm proud of them for taking this uh, step. And as I've said all along, I want to make it easy for them to be able to do this. Uh, I think there's been organizing that's happened on ours here. Uh, and that's tough, that's fine. I've had no issue with that and no problem with that. So again, I wanna be uh, publicly, explicitly supportive of their efforts, uh, while at the same time uh, acknowledge that I'm not an attorney and there are some legal issues involved here that I don't wanna overstep. Yep, Sean. I don't know why it's happening, but it is concerning to me that that number has gone up 22% because we saw how the policy was abused uh, during the uh, previous administration's years and what a horrible, uh, painful impact it had on New York City. So, uh, you know, they're going to have to explain why that number went up. I mean, the only time someone should be stopping someone is if there is reasonable suspicion that that person had done something, not because of the color of their skin, not because of the way they're dressed, not because of the neighborhood that they're living in, not because of the colors that they're wearing, not because of any of those things. That is when it should be used. Uh, and so that should be a rare tool that's used, not a tool that is overly relied upon because it creates distrust amongst law enforcement and communities where we need to build that trust. So I have no idea why the number went up, but I assume that you all are going to ask the mayor and the police commissioner to explain that. And the, but I haven't been shared any information. You know, we saw that there was a federal court case involved uh, where it was deemed unconstitutional the way that it was being practiced. I believe the decision came out in 2012. Then we had the Community Safety Act by Council Members Lander and Williams before I was elected to the council. The council spent a lot of time on this. We've been focused on this for almost a decade now, and we're going to continue to want to have answers to these questions. It's like in a hypothetical situation, if you were mayor, what would you order in terms of safety? <laughs> because like the population uh, is easy 
I'm not. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not getting involved in hypothetical. If I was mayor, <laughs> if I told the police commissioner, well, what's your Bear de Blasio tell I, I, what the shape of you? He needs to get the information about what, what, why that number went up. He needs to understand that. He needs to look precinct by precinct to understand why that's happening. He needs to have a data-driven approach to understand why that 22% increase happened. And depending on the answers that he receives, I assume that will inform the decisions he makes in working with the police commissioner and the top brass at the NYPD. But I think that number is pretty alarming. A 22% increase is not a 5% increase. It's not an 8% increase. It's, it's a very significant jump, and I want to know why that jump is so high. Uh, I think everything should be on the table. Uh, I'm not going to prejudge this group of folks that are coming together to look at ways to improve the Brooklyn Bridge. The Brooklyn Bridge is one of the most iconic spots in the entire city of New York. It's a wonderful location. It's picturesque, but also it's become dangerous. You could stand in this room basically seven days a week, 365 days a year, and look out the window and see how dangerous it is for many pedestrians to actually get on and off the bridge. And so it's not a pleasant experience. It's people can't cycle over the bridge now. It's nearly impossible because of the number of pedestrians that are on the bridge. So we need to figure out a way to make the bridge safer, safer for pedestrians, safer for cyclists. This uh, group of folks with the agency that we hired, Van Allen, to engage in this work are going to look at all of those options. I'm really glad the Department of Transportation is partnering with us on this effort. They're involved in it. Uh, but sometimes it's good to get a fresh set of eyes. I know DOT has been looking at this for a while. But to get an outside group that really has sort of no skin in the game besides being creative and thinking outside the box, I think is important. And the last thing is we put a youth component here. We want young people who probably associate the Brooklyn Bridge with the city that they were born and raised in to actually have some input. So we're going to have uh, a young person's uh, component to this, where they will make recommendations, where they will be on the judging panel. That's what we're doing. We hope to have some recommendations by the end of this year, uh, and hopefully that will inform what the de Blasio administration and Polly Trottenberg will do in making changes. Sadly, we don't have legislative authority here, uh, but I thought because of what I was seeing, what I was hearing from advocates and from everyday New Yorkers, we needed to take some proactive active steps in action, which is why we assembled this group, hired this outside entity, and put this structure in place to try to get some recommendations. On the issue of the lane closures and the bridge, I mean, it, that seems like a, a pretty significant thing to do, and I would need more information. I'd need to understand what that would look like, how much space it would take, how many, what the increase would be for cyclists and pedestrians. Uh, we would need to look at that. I don't have that information yet, and I don't want to prejudge or get out in front of this panel that we're really excited about. I want them to actually meet, uh, meet with stakeholders, look at the facts, look at the data, and come up with recommendations. Yes. Mr. Speaker, just uh, want to get your reaction to audio from former Mayor Michael Bloomberg that he gave in 2015 uh, related to stop and frisk, but he was defending it in blunt terms, becoming part of the national political conversation today. Um, what you thought of that audio coming out from 2015? I, I didn't hear the audio. When did it come out? Uh, last night. Okay. It's become a big talker today. Okay. Well, you know, stop and frisk was a uh, unacceptable tactic that was being used in New York City that was dividing communities, and we know that it was specifically targeted against uh, young black and Latino men across New York City and boys, you know, where parents were afraid to send their 11-year-old to the store to buy a gallon of milk because they weren't sure if their son was going to be stopped and frisked. There have been members of this city council, and I'll speak specifically about the chair of our public safety committee, Donovan Richards, who has spoken personally about being stopped and frisked multiple times as a young black man in New York City. 
the, it, it divided our city. I don't think it was successful. 99% of stops resulted in no gun being found while it was tearing our city apart. The city council stood up on this. We've continued to ring the bell on this, and we're not going to go back to those days. It was deemed unconstitutional, uh, and you know there are better ways to police in New York City without using a tactic like that, which divided our city for far too long. So it happened under Mayor Bloomberg's time. I know he went to uh, Errol Bernard's church at the beginning of his announcing for president and apologized for it. I haven't heard the audio. You're saying that it was from 2015. I think he apologized just a few months ago in 2020. Uh, I'm not sure when he changed his mind, but there were people that for years and years and years were telling him that this was not good for New York City. And, uh, you know, we need to learn from those lessons and not repeat history, which was so divisive and bad for our great city. Uh, let me go to Rich and then I'll go back to Bob. Uh, Rich. The governor's budget proposal uh, calls for the NYPD toe count to move out of Pier 76 by the end mm. of the year, or it's used yeah. to significant, significant <coughs> The mayor yesterday called that un unrealistic. They didn't push the governor for that part. They went with the park on that. I am glad that someone is finally prioritizing getting the NYPD tow pound moved off of Pier 76. It should have been moved off the pier uh, almost 20 years ago when the Hudson River Park Act was created in 1998. Uh, there were multiple times we thought agreements uh, had been put forward to actually move the tow pound off. So to see uh, the state pushing the envelope here and saying we are going to force the city's hand. The Hudson River Park is a jointly run entity between New York City and New York State. The board is appointees from the mayor and the governor, and so they both have a say in the future of the park. Uh, there was a bill that was vetoed that you covered, Rich, earlier this year uh, on, uh, or the end of last year, I think it was on New Year's Eve, uh, on Pier 40, which would have brought in revenue for Pier 40. We want Pier 76 to be a park and not be a tow pound. We want to finish the Hudson River Park, and so I'm glad that the governor is actually pushing the envelope here. Uh, maybe the time frame isn't realistic, but unless someone lights a fire under the city of New York, I don't think they're ever going to move. So I'm glad someone is finally pushing them to actually come up with a plan to get off of Pier 76. The community wants that pier as a park for the local community, and I'm glad we're finally pushing the envelope on that. Bob. Just a follow-up. Uh, there's hundreds of millions of dollars being spent across the country by Mayor Bloomberg describing his tenure in New York City as someone who's been civically engaged. What would you say to a friend or relative, progressively minded like yourself, to describe your perception of his tenure while he was here? You know, I, I was not in city government at the time. I was elected the year that he was leaving office. I was on the community board uh, for, you know, the decade while he was in office. There are many issues that I disagreed with him on. I disagreed with him on stop and frisk. I disagreed with him on his, his opposition to paid sick leave, to uh, the living wage law, to a lot of those issues. Uh, I'll say this. I, I want... Uh, the Democratic Party to be united when this is over. Uh, I want us to beat Donald Trump, and so I am not, uh, I have concerns, and I don't agree with all of the candidates on every issue, but I want us to stay focused on beating Donald Trump in November. That's my focus. For you? Mayor Bloomberg? Yeah. No, he's not. Sort of micro -local thing. Yes. Um, I understand that the Civic Island Civic Association is wrong. The City Island. City. Oh, okay. Yes. Wants the Harbor Patrol year round. Did you recently meet with them? Is it, has it been on your radar at all? I did not meet with them. I know about the issue. I believe that they're one of the. F I, I don't know the issue as well as I should, but I think what I heard was they're one of the few places that does it not have Harbor Patrol, and so they're seeking that. I need to understand the issue a little bit more, but uh, I mean they are an island, and a lot of people live there, and. Uh, you know, we just did some work on Hart Island, uh, right across from City Island. So it may be appropriate that they get funding for that. But I need to learn a little bit more about the issue. Have you committed to a meeting with them at all yet? Or? I have not committed to a meeting with them. I know that Councilmember Jonai has been speaking yeah, to my staff yeah. about it, and it's in his district. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, I'm, I'm happy to have conversations with people. My schedule is a little crazy to be 
I mean, I, I typically delegate these things to the local council member. It's their district. If I got involved in every local, hyper-local issue in all 51 districts, I wouldn't have time for anything else meeting-wise. So uh, I'm happy to listen and hear concerns and talk about this through the budget process, but I haven't agreed to a set or formal meeting with them, to my knowledge. Maybe I staffed it, but I haven't. <laughs> I, I, I don't know. I, I haven't been briefed on the issue. Thank you. Let me take this question. Yeah. 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 Um, in response to the recent uptick in anti-Semitic hate crimes, the city announced that they were going to be installing 100 new and like TV cameras in or at vaccination mm -hmm. um, in Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. I think we always have to balance the use of uh, technology and uh, government um, monitoring in a way that respects people's civil liberties and where we're not doing anything in a dragnet type of way, which we have seen happen in this country. But in this specific issue, there is a tremendous amount of fear right now in predominantly Jewish neighborhoods across New York City People have been focused on uh, Williamsburg and Crown Heights and Borough Park, but there are other neighborhoods across New York City as well far, that are predominantly Jewish that similarly are really scared. Far Rockaway, uh, Forest Hills, Kew Gardens, Regal Park, some neighborhoods in South Brooklyn, uh, even on the Upper East Side and Upper West Side, we have seen these anti-Semitic incidents happen with folks being attacked. We want to make sure that people feel safe. I know that the NYPD decided to actually put uh, vehicles with the turret lights running in some of these neighborhoods across New York City, uh, in particular spots where there is uh, a significant number of Jewish families, especially Orthodox families who are living there. Uh, every night of Hanukkah, there was an attack. This was after the Jersey City attack. This was before the attack in Muncie. And we want to make sure people feel safe. And part of the way to do that is to have a uniformed police presence in some of these neighborhoods. Part of the way to do that is to be responsive to the community concerns. I think a lot of these cameras were actually at the request of local communities, of people who live in those neighborhoods. We can do those things while at the same time balancing the concerns around civil liberties and the permanent installation. Uh, I haven't thought enough about it. It's something that the city of New York should be uh, mindful of when we are putting in technology like this. How often do we uh, check and see if it's necessary to be there? Do we want it to be there for 10 years, 20 years, 25 years? How often are we looking at the footage? What's the footage being used for? All of those things I think are real issues that we should look at. But in this moment in time, I do think it's appropriate that we should be uh, using our resources to protect neighborhoods across New York City that have been targeted with anti-Semitic violence. And I'm proud that the city of New York are taking those steps. Okay, thank you, thank you very much. You have a question? Yes. Yeah, I just wanted to go back to the bridge real quick. Yes. Just because the bridges have numbers that need to be visible to see and, and have those contacts, can you talk about uh, that? Let me see here. I think there are some numbers. Hold on one second. Um, I don't have the numbers on me, though there are numbers related to the number of pedestrians and cyclists, the surge in pedestrians and the decrease in cyclists associated with crossing the Brooklyn Bridge. And we are going to be using those statistics and numbers as part of the planning process. The goal is to make the bridge safer for all people who want to use it. And right now it is too clogged, too crowded, too congested, and it's really unsafe and dangerous at many points during the day, especially when the weather's nice, especially on the weekend. It basically becomes impassable uh, for folks. So we are going to try to figure out what those numbers show and are there uh, potential mitigations we can use to make it safer from a, from a design perspective uh, to make it easier for people to get across the bridge. And I'm happy to uh, share those numbers with you. The staff can get those for you. Great. Thank you all.